Hi, in this lesson we're going to be talking about IP addressing. So IP addresses are needed for network communication, so without them uh, you cannot communicate on a traditional network. So if you've been working with computers for a while, you've most likely seen IP addresses, uh, you know, similar to 192, 168, 1.1, and that type of thing. That's an IPv4 address, and of course there's IPv6 addresses, uh, which are a lot larger and a lot more complicated. Okay, so let's go over some of the key aspects of IP addressing. So uniqueness, so every computer on the network, if it's on the same network, has to have a unique IP address. You can't have the same IP address on two different computers or devices on the same network, otherwise things are going to start getting confused. So this doesn't apply to separate networks, so if you have two different networks in two different locations, you could use the same IP addresses in both and not have a problem. And of course, for public IP addresses, those have to be unique for sure, because those are being used on the internet in the public. All right, so like I said, uh, there are two types of IP addresses, IPv4, which you've probably experienced, the most commonly used for now until IPv6 takes over. So IPv4 is the 32-bit address, and IPv6 is a 128-bit address. And you can see in the examples here that they're quite different in length there. There, are, there is a way to shorten the IPv6 address to make it a little more user-friendly. All right, so classes and subnets. This is for IPv4. So IPv4 addresses like this 192.168.1.1, they're broken down into four octets, as they're called, so four different sections here. And so these also are divided into classes A, B, C, D, and E, with each with its own range and purpose, depending on your application. And then you could further break these down using subnetting, which is a whole other topic. You can make a whole course on that. This would get quite complicated as well. So this is used to segregate into the smaller network. So let's say you wanted to have a marketing or sales network and keep everything separate or your own IT network. You could use subnetting for that. All right, so like I mentioned, public and private IP addresses. The public ones are used on the internet and have to be unique. Uh, private are internal and you could use one of the various ranges of private IP addresses, so it's up to you how you want to structure your network. All right, then we have dynamic and st static IP addresses. Most of the time you're going to be using dynamic, which, which means that there's a DHCP server that's giving out these IP addresses when your computer starts uh, based on the range that you assign to it. So if the computer boots up, it says, hey, I need an IP address, and it'll give it an address based on the range that is applied to that DHCP server. And then once that lease is up, the computer will have to renew it. Most of the time, it'll get the same IP address, but there's a chance it could get a different one. Then you have static IP addresses, which are commonly used for servers and switches and other devices that, that you don't want the network address to change. Because obviously, if you have like a file server, you don't need it changing its IP address just in case some people are accessing it uh, via the IP address. All right, DNS I've talked about before. So that makes IP addresses human-friendly. So when you type in google.com, it knows how to translate it to Google's IP addresses, so you don't have to actually type in an IP address in your web browser. Then we have network masks, which I talked about for subnetting. Uh, those will define the network portion of the IP address and the host portion. So the mask specifies how many bits are used for the network part and how many are used for the host part. And I'll show you an example of that coming up here in a graphic. And then, like I mentioned, IPv6, uh, that'll be taking over IPv4 eventually, since we're out of public IPv4 addresses, not private, because you could reuse those, but, not, but the publics have to be unique. And so, most likely, we'll never run out of uh, IPv6 addresses, because there's so many of them. All right, so here we have a graphic of a simple network divided up into different segments here. So you can see the one on the left here, 192.168.1.0. That is the network address, and then this computer has a 192.168.1.100. So this 100 is the number that you could change. Anything that's in the network address has to stay the same for this network, and then the host address you could change accordingly. So if I want to make this you know, 200 or 53 or whatever, then I could change that and not have to worry about it. But of course, you're going to have to have unique IP addresses within this network network segment itself. So you can't have two computers with 192.168.1.100. And then we have this lightning bolt graphic here. You could kind of think of that as a switch maybe separating the two 
network segments here. So this next one here is 192.168.2.0. And then within this network, we have a 2.101. You could have 102. You could have multiple other computers attached to this network here, all with their own unique IP addresses. And then, of course, here we have another one on the 2 network, just to give you an example of two different computers on the same network. So here's 100 and 101. And then here we have another network connection with the uh, three with its own IP address and so on. So this network address and this host address, it's not always going to be like this where the first three are the network and the last one is the host. So that'll depend on the subnet mask. We'll determine how this is broken up. Okay, so now let's take a moment to talk about IPv4 versus IPv6. Uh, a little more detail here. All right, so IPv4, like I said, 32-bit address with a finite number of possible IPv4 addresses, most widely used. And then we have IPv6, which was a 128-bit address. So we have a much larger number of possible addresses for IPv6 than IPv4. So some highlights of IPv6, more address space. So there's enough IPv6 addresses for every device on the planet to have multiple addresses. That tells you how many addresses you could use with IPv6. So it'll be years and years and years before we ever run out of them, if ever. Okay, so improved security for IPv6, built-in security features, uh, which makes IPv6 more secure against attacks, and improved performance, smaller header and reduced fragmentation. So that's a big benefit right there when it comes to uh, network performance. So here's a chart with some other details about the difference between IPv4 and v6. So if you want to go through and kind of read that yourself and you can kind of get a better idea of uh, what the difference is between the two. Okay, so there's several ways to find your IP address. So we're going to show you how to do it in Windows. So the process is going to be different for Linux, for your Mac, uh, for your phone or tablet, of course. So the easiest way for Windows is to just open a command prompt. So do a search for CMD. You got a command prompt here. You don't need to run it as administrator. All right, so a couple ways. So if you want the simple way, just IP config, I P C O N F I G, enter. That tells you this is my IP address for this computer here and the subnet mask and the gateway. And the gateway is what gets you outside of your network. So in my case, out to the internet. So here's my IPv4 address, as you could tell by the four octets there. So it's not a long one like this one, which is the IPv6. All right, so other ways you could do it if you go to your network settings here. Right click on it, network and internet settings. So depending on ver what version of Windows, this might look a little different too. So I can see this is using an ethernet connection. So if I click on ethernet, it's using DHCP. So my router is giving it the IP address and same for the DNS server, it's getting it from the router. So here's my IPv4 address. Here's my IPv6 address. And then the MAC address, which is the hardware ID for my network card. And then of course from control panel, if you prefer the control panel method, network and sharing center, you could click on change adapter settings to see your available adapters. This one just has one. You could right click on it, status, and then go to details and you get that same information. So now I wanna take a moment to mention network address translation or NAT as it's commonly called. So you probably heard this term and you don't realize that your even your home network is using this. So let's say we have the internet coming into your wireless router here, and then your wireless router is connecting to your computer, your tablet, your phone. So there's one public IP address coming in, yet all these devices are connecting to that one public IP address here. So let's read this real quicker. Network address translation is a method of mapping an IP address used on a private local network, which are these guys here, to a public IP address used on the wider internet right here. So this makes it possible for multiple devices on a private network to share a single public IP address. So therefore you only need one public IP address, but you can connect multiple devices to that one public IP address. Otherwise, if it wasn't for NAT, each one of your devices would have to have its own public IP address. And of course that's not gonna work because those cost money and there's not enough of them to go around to begin with. So NAT will be built into your router, so you don't have to worry about it because it does it all for you. Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe.